Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's segment of First in Focus. Today with us, we have Alan Gregory and FRC Team 3847 Spectrum. Alan is the 2019 Woody Flowers winner, and Spectrum is the 2019 Roebling Division winner. Today's focus is on Spectrum's do's and don'ts, tidbits from their success. Questions will be answered at the end, so feel free to drop any questions you might have in the Q&A box during the presentation. Now, without further ado, take it away, Spectrum. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Christine. Um, like you said, I'm Alan Gregory. I'm the head coach for Spectrum. With me today are Ethan and Jack, two graduating Spectrum seniors. Um, and yeah, so we're going to go through just some bits of advice for um, that we think um, other teams could take away from some of the things that we've done in the past. Um, specifically, I want to make very sure that this is some things that we do. This is not necessarily saying that other teams should do these things. Other teams have had success going very different directions in some of these things. Um, some of these are about our manufacturing process. Um, some of it is about how we like approach games and strategy. And a lot of this is just what's worked for us and what we've developed over the years. If you have a different opinion or you have a different way of doing it and it's working for you, feel free to continue doing that. Definitely our way is not necessarily the right way. It's just the way that we've kind of been doing it for a while. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I think I'm in charge of the first slide. Um, so one of the things we've been trying to do, especially uh, over the last three or four years and really reinforcing um, is catting every single thing before we build it. So even a lot of our prototypes and things, we'll make sure we pull up uh, SOLIDWORKS, what our normal CAD program had been, and start sketching some things out, getting our rough dimensions before we actually build it in whatever prototyping system or however we're going to build the prototype for it. Um, and then as we move through the season, almost everything gets catted before it goes on the robot. So if we know wherever each individual electronic thing gets put there, so we know where the zip ties are gonna go for it. We try to get as much detail into the robots as we can. Um, not everything, some years we'll forget some stuff and there's some things that don't, we don't think have to be catted, but even then we'll try to add it back so that if we're updating, if we're changing something, we know where it is and we know we can um, make the modifications we need to throughout the season. Just because whenever you're, it's never just built once, almost everything on our robots are built dozens of times almost by the end. Uh, so it's really important for us to CAD a lot. We don't just CAD the initial full robot. A lot of times you'll see over on that left, that's a, what we call like Crayola CAD or Block CAD. Uh, that first week or so of the season, we'll be laying out robots and just kind of get a feel for things in 3D and really quick sketches and really basic extrusions. They're definitely nowhere close to details. Um, that helps like our sub teams be able to take that and kind of build out the details as we go and get finer and finer grain of details throughout the season. Uh, Jack? Uh, yes. So one thing we make sure to do is consider our manufacturing process while we're designing parts. Uh, our primary ways of making parts now are either sheet metal, laser cut, and bent by our sponsor, or laser cutting on our in-house laser. And we try to base, and we also, all of our shafts are made on our lathe, but we try to limit are designing to mainly using those tools to make them because we are that's what we're the best at doing and can make the most precise parts with. Um, this year we started adding more 3D printing to actual robot parts. Uh, a lot, most of our pulleys are 3D printed this year and some other parts are also 3D printed. Uh, we also want to make sure that we consider assembly and maintenance when we're designing parts because uh, it's possible that a part can fit together in SOLIDWORKS, but when you try to put it together in real life, it will not actually go together for one reason or another. Um, and then we also make sure that we look at what fasteners we're planning on doing, using, uh, to see, because some fasteners may interfere with chain or moving mechanisms. Uh, they don't all, we don't make sure they don't all have to be catted, but we make sure to think about where they're going to be and what they're going to be. Uh, yeah, Jack wanted to make sure this got in there because in 2018, I definitely designed a part of the robot, then told him to build it, and that was very much not possible. Um, and I don't think he's ever let me live that one down. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that you as well, Jack? I think. Yeah. Uh, we use, we try to use 
only the most common motors. This year we only used Falcons, Neos, and Neo 550s. Uh, before we started getting brushless motors, we used mini Sims and 775 Pros primarily. We had a few bag motors. Um, we try to avoid any other motor just because it's hard for us. We don't have stocks of them already built up and it's harder to get a spare if you're at an event because most teams aren't using them. And then we also have uh, gearboxes that already work with all of our normal motors and that's easier to use, that are easier to use for us in general. All right. Um, so this one is probably where we differentiate a lot from other teams. Um, it's kind of weird, and it's one of the things that we definitely do on Spectrum, um, specifically, and we'll design mechanisms around this philosophy, and it works for us, um, is we'll limit how many times we put a shaft through a bearing. A lot of this is for that designing for maintenance system. Um, it also allows you to get some stronger structures when you're building out of flat parts as well. Um, so basically what this means is we'll, do, we'll use dead axle systems, um, like our drivetrain, instead of having um, the actual hex shaft spinning in a bearing somewhere, our drivetrains are almost all built with half inch round tube with half inch bearings in the wheels and then sprockets drive those wheels. Um, a lot of our intakes the last two years have used our Spectrum dead axle roller system. Uh, there's a whole blog post about like what all the parts are and how that works. Um, but basically there's a full solid seven eighths tube that crosses the intake and then that doesn't rotate and will spin a polycarb tube um, on top of that. Um, and then also we'll use, if we do need hex shafts, like there definitely are times where a half inch hex shaft is the best way to go. Um, starting back in 17, um, when West Coast Products released their Versa roller system, I think even back then it was just the roller system, um, they showed that you could just uh, put shoulder bolts through 3 8 bearings. So we'll do that a lot. So our entire tower this year, um, the bottom live axles, we're having to power the belts. Um, there's 3 8 bearings on the side and then shoulder bolts that go into the hex shafts. And that lets us, if we need to just swap an entire shaft, you unscrew those two shoulder bolts, pull it out, put a whole replacement shaft in, bolt it in place, and you're not sliding anything through hex bearings, you're not sliding anything around. Um, some of the reasons we do this, um, like I said, it allows for much easier maintenance. Um, it also makes for quicker iterations. If we need to swap the side plates, if we laser cut new side plates, we can just swap the plates, we unbolt the things, put them back together, and we're not sliding anything around. Assembly becomes a lot faster this way. Um, also, if, if anything gets damaged at an event or something, we can have entire rollers ready to swap in and out, um, and it happens really, really fast. Um, we don't have to worry about thunder hex tolerances. We're very rarely sanding down a bunch of thunder hex to try to make it fit through bearings. Um, gearboxes are one of the exceptions. So we do have, there are, I think there's only two hex or thunder hex bearings on our entire 2020 and, 20, or 2019 robot each. Um, this year there were two on the climber shaft. We had to have a shaft run across the entire bottom of the robot for the elevator so we could power both sides of it. Um, so there are two, at least two hex bearings down there. There might be four, I'm not really sure. Um, 2019, I know there were only two. They're both at the end of Versa Planetary Gearboxes, like supporting the other end of those shafts. Um, so yeah, so most teams may have a bunch of them. We still use them. We have a ton of prototypes and stuff where we need them, but we don't have them on the robot very often on the final design. Um, and then there's some other gearbox where we'll have round bearings where we actually turn down the hex um, and capture the shaft with the round bearings. Um, so we do that into gearbox and things, but as much as we can, we try to use dead axles um, as we just find it stiffens up a lot of the flat plates that we design a lot of our robot with. Um, another thing that we try to do at early on in the season as we're designing a lot of the mechanisms is we're not always 100% sure exactly how fast we want something to go. We don't know exactly how much torque it needs, so we'll design ways to adjust the power to a mechanism. Um, so one of those ways is a lot of times if it's at the beginning, we may design it with a planetary gearbox in place. Um, I think this year we got rid of every one of them. Is that correct guys? I think it is. Um, so yeah, there, weren't, there ended up not being any versus planetary or uh, 57 sports or ultra planetaries anywhere on our competition robot by the end, but most of the systems started being designed that way. So like the first iteration would have a um, versus planetary and then we'd swap gear ratios to kind of figure out exactly what worked and we get a rough estimate based off one of the gear calculators or something um, design a system that used the VPs first so we can make sure it was right um, and then we would build out a belt and pulley or another gear system to make sure it worked the whole way through um, 
We'll also design things with the um, VEX Pro 10, 11, 12 tooth pinions that all say, share the same gear spacing. Um, so most of the time our drivetrain, we'll make sure that we have a couple different ranges we can hit if we decide, oh, we built this thing and oh, we think it might be a little too slow, so we'll design it in a way to increase the speed a little bit. If to later in the season we want to just crank it up a little bit, we'll swap from a 10 to a 12 tooth pinion and be able to do that. Um, similarly, if there's other mechanisms, we'll do the same thing with gear families. So we'll know what gear spacing we can build something at. And even if we don't need it, it may have to package it a little bit bigger to fit a gear family. Then we can later on in the season make it faster, make it slower without having to redesign a bunch of stuff, we can keep those gear families. Um, the other thing we'll do sometimes is we'll add spots for extra motors if we need it, if we think we might need a lot more torque. We may design something that has a spot for two motors but only use one most of the time, but then no, we could add a second if we end up needing it. Um, okay, essentially these are mine. Um, <laughs> another thing that we do for most of our mechanisms, they're gonna move with um, pneumatics, like both of our intakes last year, or this year and last year. Um, and all of our elevators is we make sure to design in spring assist. Um, so for elevators, this is really common for a lot of teams do this, it's not very rare, um, to have constant four springs helping the elevator move up and down. But on our last two intakes, um, we've had torsion springs on oh, our 2018 intake as well. Um, we've had torsion springs as well that allow for force on that rotational pivot of the intake or on the open and close in 2018. Um, and so those just help the pneumatics. If you have a closed position, it helps default to that position. Um, it helps fight gravity. It allows you to get away with a lot smaller pneumatics, use less air. Um, so you can design around a relatively cheap part. They cost a dollar, two dollars each. Um, and they can save you a lot when you're actually doing the design. Um, we try to, we've over the years kind of figured out how we want to build bumpers and these are kind of our guidelines on how to build bumpers. So we have broken many of these rules before, but uh, we try and we're going to try in the future not to. Uh, we build full wrap bumpers uh, because they're stronger and they help protect your frame more. It also stops you from getting hooked by another robot and kind of getting stuck. Um, we do not build reversible bumpers ever because it can, they can switch colors mid-match, which would lead to you being disabled and possibly losing a match. And then we use sailcloth for our bumpers because it makes us slicker and it makes it easier for us to slide off of defenders. And then we always design in how we are going to mount our bumpers just to make sure that we know how they're gonna be mounted because bumpers falling off are one of the worst ways to lose a match. Um, and it, adding on to the not reversible bumpers, especially now when we don't have bag anymore, and with so with robots getting a lot more drive time and practice time, you're going to end up having to have swappable bumpers anyway. Like you shouldn't probably be running your comp bumpers all the time through practice. So having to have to swap your bumpers anyway, making them reversible, you lose some of that advantage of not being able to like permanently mount them or anything. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of where we try to go to. We like like Jack said, we built bumper gaps before, we built frame gaps before. But in general, when we can, our initial kind of robot design process is we try to assume we're going to have a full wrap bumper um, and then really have to, somebody has to make a good argument on why we need to do something else. Um, yeah, and then oh, for our on our 2019 robot, we had two Cs that had no gap, basically. But we've decided against doing that in the future because that led to damage to our front rail and back rail. Yeah, so if you have any spots where the bumpers aren't a solid piece of wood, when you if you take enough hits, like we just played so many more matches last year, 2019 was the first year in the district system, that eventually some part of the front frame started bending it a little bit because we didn't have that continuous piece of wood there. Um, we make sure every year to have organized subsystems. Every subsystem on our team has a separate bin, like the ones on the left, and then one of the ones on the right, each subsystem also has one of those to store repair parts or any tools they need. Uh, it makes it really easy to make quick repairs in the pit because you know where all of your supplies are to make a repair. And you know exactly, you can get them all from one place and don't have to look in a bunch of places to get them. 
Yeah, and also if for each subsystem, they make sure they have like any unique fasteners that they need that aren't our very like specific general ones that we have, they'll hold them in their subsystem. So if they know they're running low, they have to go check on, see if we have them in stock somewhere. If not, they let me know and we get through, or through, the, or through our ordering process and get more in stock. So if anything is loose, our sub team leads can make sure to go through um, and get everything we need for the robot. So we always have it at events and we have spares ready. We know where everything is. Um, if something like between matches, we'll just grab, if, if we know something's broken, somebody will know what bin to grab, what TSAC bin to start opening. And we'll have those parts ready really fast. We're not looking through our pit. We're not looking through our lab to try to find anything. So do scout matches. Scouting is something that's very useful for match strategy and alliance selection. And we currently use AppSheet on tablets to scout, but in the past we've used uh, Spam Team 180's core man scouting system. And we also used 1296's version of 180 scouting system. But for the most part, find what works for you. Scouting can be very useful. But what you don't want to do is don't scout unnecessary data. If you don't actively use data in scouting meetings for pick lists or for match strategy, it's best to not scout. We used to scout like score drops and draw auton paths on our scouting sheets, but that data wasn't actually ever useful. Uh, for instance, at Champs in 2019, we realized from our previous events through iterating that we didn't really care where teams placed their hatches in cargo, only that they placed the hatches in cargo. So we didn't actually write down like whether it was high or low or cargo ship or rocket. That didn't actually matter to us. Uh, in terms of the robots themselves, we already knew based on like pictures that we took and scouting, just watching the robots, whether or not they could score high or not. We only actually cared that they could, how many patches and cargo they scored in general. Uh, define team standards. So defining and standardizing is a good thing to do. It helps you stay organized and prevent many easily avoidable mistakes. Here's just an example of some of the standards that we have on Spectrum. Our Anderson connectors, red and white are on the right, one looking from the top. Fasteners, we mostly use 832s, 1024s, and quarter 20s. This isn't saying that you should do things the way that we do. Find what works for you, do things the way you do it, define team standards and stick to it. Yeah, so this is one of those ones that gets added slowly throughout our whole history. Um, like we'll have students who, we have a student who worked on the brand standard. She graduated in 2016, but it's still the same. It's largely the same. It gets updated a little bit, but it's largely the same standard. So we'll have students who have projects kind of throughout their time that we just add and make it easier for the next students to come on board. It's easier to learn how to do something in the, the spectrum way, basically, if we have it all documented and ready to go. So do prioritize game tasks. Whenever like a game comes out, prioritize which tasks are important and know what tasks to avoid. Uh, you can look at past games and robots to see what has worked and how some of those elements apply to uh, this year's specific challenge. And evaluate your goals and make your decisions accordingly. Uh, sometimes it's not like as obvious as it seems. One of our goals going into this year was that we wanted to rank really high, like rank one at our events. However, our robot can't pick up partners and we also can't spin the color but the reason why we chose to do that is uh, the time that we would have spent developing those and iterating and uh, integrating those with the rest of our systems is time taken away from improving our shooter, our intake, which if we improve those things, that allows us to better just play the game and win our matches. And that's what we're going to try. Right. And so, we, we, did, we did kind of start designing those. So we did have subsystems working on them, but we made sure that those weren't the priority. Another big example this year, uh, especially, was that uh, we did not build our robot to be able to go under the trench. Uh, we saw no advantage in building short uh, for many reasons. Building tall means that we had like a higher point of release and our shooter was not able to be blocked. And also building low means it was harder to package uh, a lot of the subsystems and we would have to build more compact and complex subsystems. That's a lot of time and effort, time and effort we could have spent to building and fleshing out a more simpler, robust, consistent tall robot. Another big thing is we don't use weighted decision matrices, especially if doing weighted decision matrices in large groups, it doesn't make sense. Different people have different opinions and people have different scaling of numbers and it's just very inconsistent and arbitrary. But even like the, like the concept of a weighted decision matrix in and of itself doesn't actually make that much sense because that means like of all the categories, all the differences in like the score need to be analogous because you're adding all the numbers up together. That's not actually how decision making works. So uh, just weighted decision matrices aren't really a good way to make decisions. Also, how many categories are there? All these things are really arbitrary and it doesn't actually work out. And uh, what you should do is 
or what we do is we make decisions based on consensus. Don't vote. Voting, like the classic example is that, let's say you have a really close vote, it's like 11 to 8, half people are now really salty and don't like the idea that was voted for, and the final product isn't going to be as good. Consensus allows you to better examine other points of views and develop ideas into one agreed upon choice so everyone's on the same page. Okay, so this one is very game specific clearly, but it's one of the ones that I will, uh, is a, one of the hills I'll die on for a while, so I wanted to include it. Um, largely, the vast majority of MRC teams should never build a ramp bot. They're just really hard. Like we had to have this, we, there were so many people telling people not to build them in 18, um, in 18 and 19, and still a lot of teams did, and I will never understand why. Um, like good ramps are so hard to do. Like even in 2007, where you pretty much had to do it in some way to have the end game, there were still ramp plots were so hard. The elite of the elite teams were having trouble doing it. The, the platforms that picked you up were a little bit better. Um, it's just so much difficult relying on a partner to have the both robot design to be able to drive up your ramp. So however steep of a grade you have, the robot has to be able to do that. Um, and then also having the driver finesse enough to be able to do a very hard task, which is driving up a ramp. Even when we've had just end games where the end game was driving up a ramp in like 06, it's not easy to do. Um, not a lot of people, not, you know, none of the students have memory going back that far. Not a ton of mentors do. But even in 06, just getting on that platform at the end of the match was a hard task. Um, so doing it on a ramp they've never seen before in a match with very little time to actually do your team strategy, to figure it out beforehand, to test it. Like there's a lot of work that goes into getting another robot to drive on top of you. Uh, so platforms and forks are normally better. We saw that in um, we saw that in 18, um, and we saw that with I guess Citrus in 19. Not a lot of other people were lifting people up. Um, but even in certain games like this year, there were very few um, forks or platform buddy climbs that ever got anything working. There were a few teams who tried to design them and tried. We had a design that never got on the comp bot. Um, and it's just difficult to get somebody else to line up, get it all in place. It takes a lot of in-match time to do. So you have to really decide if it's worth it, and it very rarely is. Um, so our, probably going forward, our goal is probably to not design one unless we think our champs Elims Alliance will be using it. Um, where in 18, that was probably true. Was probably false in 19, so that was that especially false this year too. Or almost certainly, our champs alliance wouldn't be using the buddy climb. Uh, so because of that, that's kind of our going forward. Where we think we're if we're having to decide on games, that's one of the metrics we'll use to decide if we want to do anything that lifts a partner. So don't fall into the sunk cost fallacy. Just because you put effort into something doesn't mean you need to continue down that path. Uh, you should always reevaluate based on your goals and weigh your options uh, accordingly. Uh, there have been many times in the past where we have designed something. For example, in 2015, we built an entire robot and ended up not using uh, anything but the drive base come actual competition. Uh, that robot, the original robot, never touched the carpet. Uh, in 2019, we spent the first eight weeks of the season working on a four bar climber. We never really got to work, but we were close and we could have got it, gotten it to work in time for champs. However, we reevaluated and decided that instead we should scrap this subsystem entirely and we should instead build a suction climb that would allow us to be more successful at champs. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this, this also especially happens kind of going back to how you choose how things get designed on your team and how you assign things. It's very early on. We talk about making sure that it, no, nobody is, nobody's subsystem Everybody's subsystem could be completely redone on any day and kind of everyone goes in knowing that. So like they're working on something, but they're also working on other people's stuff and we're helping build the entire robot. So no one feels like, oh, this one thing got removed, therefore I didn't help with the robot and we don't want anyone to ever feel that way. And so like our entire team is working on the whole robot, even if we have subsystem leads, which we do, um, we make it very clear from the beginning, you are separate from whatever the design you're working on and whatever subsystem you're working on. Um, just so that if something has to be scrapped, like we've scrapped intakes, we've scrapped lots of things that had to just been, oop, this, you worked on this for four weeks, cool, we're, you know, that goes over there in the corner, we're building something new now. Um, once we realize we can do that, or if we have time to do that, uh, especially now, we, I mean, coming up now, we have an entire, almost, you know, nine months or so till the next competition, 10 months. Uh, so it's gonna be very interesting to see how that plays out um, with teams um, who are able to actually make changes or change entire robots now. 
Okay, um, this is definitely one of the things that we do um, and have been doing for a very long time on Spectrum. Um, we work pretty hard to document our progress, right? Our build blog has been out since my first year with the team in 2012. Um, and so basically every single day that we're meeting during the season, we're documenting what we're doing. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of benefits to it. Um, some of the ways we do it um, that make it easier for me now that we've kind of done this process for eight years now um, is having a common photo gallery. Um, so we switched over to Smug Mug after we talked to um, Team 624 a few years ago. Um, that's what they were using and that's helped us a lot. It allows us to just send the entire team a link that when they click on it, they can upload straight from their phone to our build season gallery. So if they're working on a prototype, they see something that's cool, they take a photo, take some video of it, upload it straight to there so then we have it in a common place that we can then share with everybody. Um, yeah, we try to make it very easy so everybody on the team is part of that documentation process. Um, we also do have a uh, media and awards mentor, Sue Ann, who helps us. Um, and so she's good on bugging people if for some reason people aren't taking photos regularly. Um, she'll go around and take some, but she also makes sure that other people are kind of part of that process. Um, this year specifically, we worked to have a better um, design review process that we held more firm to. Our design review is definitely different than the one that um, Citrus Circuits talked about um, a few weeks ago with you all. So our design review is less for specific um, specific details about the robot that we're changing. Like those happen more one-on-one, -on -one, um, similar to how they do it. Like somebody will just call me over and I'll look at their computer, kind of go through the CAD with them um, or somebody else on the team will do the same thing. Um, but for our design reviews, a lot of that is, so we don't have any specifically required meetings on Spectrum. So no, and no one like gets kicked off the team if they miss so many meetings or if they're not there at certain times. Like we have students who are doing other extracurriculars. Um, so there's a lot of come and go. So every Tuesday, if you're there for that first hour, you can kind of get caught up on everything that's happened over the last week. Um, and this also gets sent out to our parents and other people who want to follow along with the team. They can kind of see that whole process. So each of the um, subsystem leads document kind of what they did over the week, what changes happened to their subsystem, photos, videos, um, and that's easy. That also gets put on our blog now. Um, and then, yeah, so the daily blogs have been going on um, every year. Some years I'm better about it. Some years the team is better about it. Um, this year we were pretty good about keeping it up almost every day. Um, largely, I try to do it as the last thing I leave before I go home. Um, and then they'll either, students will send me things that they want to include in the blog, or I'll go around and kind of figure out what we did that day and take some photos. Um, most of it is my writing, not all of it. There are days when it's other people, there are days when people take over the blog. Um, a lot of it is their photos and their progress though, and I'll summarize or I'll paraphrase what they told me. Um, and then we try our hardest just to say our project, our progress and answer questions whenever we can, um, just to help in the community and get people um, doing more with what they have and what we have. Um, we want to rise as many teams up as we can and help them build robots that are effective and they're happy about and they can be inspired about. Um, okay, I think this is our last main slide. One of the things that going back and documenting our progress helps us do is once we get to the event, we're able to have handouts ready for the judges. Um, so we make a robot handout that kind of describes the robot system. So when we're talking to judges who want to talk about more of the technical things, um, the students have a nice, easy layout to do that with. We can talk about each subsystem. Um, this year, we even blew it up as a whole like poster size, so it was on the side of our pit. Um, and then we also make a magazine that we hand out that happens more of our outreach and culture and kind of about our team and is a lot less technical things. It doesn't have almost any robot in it. Um, so that gets handed out to the pit judges. It also goes gets handed out to the chairman's judges. Um, and so that just kind of describes our team history and has everything in it in this nice magazine form. Um, so it's nice and brief, seven to eight pages, lots of pictures, um, easy to go through for the judges that they have this physical thing that they can take with them um, back into the judge room, share with other judges if they need to. We're just trying to get them to remember our team um, with something physical. Um, okay, so I think, so we have a couple other slides that we're not gonna go through specifically. Um, but we can leave up if we want to go and start q a if people want to ask questions about these they can these are ones that basically didn't get to none of us chose to make them their own big slide but there are other things that we do on spectrum yep. thank you so much for an awesome presentation next we'll be moving into the q a section if you have any questions please make sure to drop them in the q a box we might have too many questions than we have time for but we'll do our best to get to everybody's questions our first question is from um 
our first question is, what are Spectrum's plans for the recently announced 2021 Game Changers game? That is a good question. Um, so we haven't had a ton of time to think about it. So we've, we've, we've discussed as a team. Um, we're always kind of discussing what we would improve on a robot no matter what. Like we've talked about not getting uh, sunk, it, not abiding by the sunk cost fallacy. Um, so we're always thinking about ways to improve our robot and what we would do differently. Um, we look at other people's robots a lot. Like there's, if they're pretty much every reveal video and stuff either gets shown during our meetings or gets thrown into our Slack. Like we're really big about looking at other teams' robots, um, looking through their CAD, all of that stuff. We just like looking at the rest of what the community shares. Um, so we've had a lot of ideas and seen a lot of matches that other people played in the two weeks of infinite recharge that were played this year. Um, so there are a lot of things that we will do. Um, we're just not 100% sure on what those plans are yet. That's great. The next question is from chat. It's what wall thickness do you use for your drive trains? Um, we use 0.09 inch thickness sheet metal. Yeah, the last back to what 13, basically almost all of them have been 0.09 sheet metal. Um, this year was a little bit different. Jack, do you want to talk about this year, how it wasn't the front and back weren't sheet metal? Uh, yeah, this year our front and back rails were two by one, which we just bought from Vex Pro. Um, we did that because we felt it would be stronger and it also makes it a lot easier for us to change our width if we ever needed to, because we can just cut a new two by one instead of having to have our sponsor laser cut and bend a new front or back rail. Yeah, we, we realized we were never really mounting that much to the front and back rails. We were almost always mounting just to the wheel wells. Um, so we were trying to figure out how can we make that easier on our sponsors, easier for us to do. Um, there's a lot less labor involved in just cutting a two by one. And then we have um, thread all or threaded rod going through the whole side, clamped together on both sides um, to hold it to the two sheet metal um, drive rails. That's interesting. Thank you. Another question from chat. What do you recommend for teams that are not able to manufacture to as high a level of accuracy for bumpers? Not to try to figure out the question. The, the, the question is like, yeah. is like it, look, full wrap bumpers may require higher level of accuracy is what the, the question the person is asking. Uh, mm. So should, what, should they make trade-offs to like make not full wrap bumpers or what should they do? I guess that's kind of true. I mean, we've made full back bumpers all the way back in like 2014 when we didn't even have a router yet. So like, it's definitely possible. We were doing it with a bandsaw and circular saws. You can do it. Um, it just takes a little bit more time. We would build up a frame, test fit it, redo parts of it if we needed to. Um, I think this is the first year we ever CNC'd any of our bumpers, right? Jack, you did the, uh, you did the yeah. router, right? This year they were done on the router and we did tabs to connect the sides together. But before this year, they've basically just been bandsawed every year. Yeah, I must say we just measure, we will get to the point where we have the full robot done, measure the actual robot. Like we have an idea of what it comes out in CAD, but it's never quite exactly right. So we'll measure the real robot, check for any bolt tolerances, that kind of thing. Um, and then we just make sure, I think part of it, I think Jack mentioned it, but the big thing is early on, we make sure to design in the bumper mounting system, basically as before we send out the drivetrain, we wanna know how the bumpers are mounted. Um, so that we have an idea in our drivetrain frame or whatever we're doing, that we have ideas for how the bumpers are mounted really early. We may not build the bumpers this year, we were stapling the fabric the morning before we left for Dripping Springs, but <laughs> we, we had thought about them back on like day two of build season. So our next question is from Chief Delphi. What does your team structure look like for students? Do you have team captains or sub teams? Um, we have we don't have team captains or subsystem leads or sub teams. We have kind of for our actual robot construction, we basically have subsystem leads, which are basically people who are in charge of each different subsystem. They're not really officially there's no official title or anything. It's just kind of, you're the person who primarily works on that. Sometimes other people will help and work on it also. Um, for other tasks, we don't really have any kind of leadership roles. Um, every year to, well, we have to decide drive team every year. And basically what we do uh, is send out a form for nominations that any student can fill out, um, which just lets everyone have 
an opinion based on who they think should be on the drive team and if they want to be on the drive team. And then the final decision just comes down to Alan. Yeah, so there, the nomination form, you're allowed to nominate yourself for any position. And a lot of that is just so there are things I clearly don't know um, about all student relationships and things, how people work together, what their opinions are. Um, so they're just informing me. Um, and then I'll work with either um, some years we'll know ahead of time, kind of this year we did provisional driver and operator, right? Is what we called it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll make sure to talk to kind of who's going to be, like, a lot of it is who bubbles up and who becomes leaders on the team. Like not to say that we don't have captains is true, but we clearly have leaders on the team, right? People do more work. People are there longer. They're more knowledgeable. Um, there are people, people, other team members know they can go ask questions to. Um, so I'll work with that group of people to make sure we're putting together the best drive team to help us win matches um, based on people who have done work throughout the season, um, kind of how I think people are going to work together. Um, and then we have some other roles at events that get assigned to. So we'll have like pit bosses. Um, we have some of the strategy leads, um, that type of stuff gets assigned for events. Um, but throughout the year, we don't have very specific positions. Um, Ethan, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, there's no like team president or anything in terms of how like the structure is just as a team, there's no like official roles. Uh, you just, you just are whatever you decide to do. Like if you do work to, for outreach and chairmen's and you, you're on the chairman's team, I suppose. Yeah, but we, but that same, at that same time, there are people who are, are chairman's people, but they're also strategy captains or scouting leads. Um, we've had people who were who have done everything from design subsystems to also help with programming to do some of the electrical like we have people who can float back and forth it just depends on where they're interested in what they've how much work they put into learning different parts of it um some of it's what day you show up and what we're working on that day um like outside of the specific sub team leads that kind of have to make sure they're uh, or that their subsystem leads they have to kind of make sure their subsystems moving along everybody else some of them will attach to some of the subsystem leads um, and kind of be assigned to them for a little while and make sure that's working too Others, they'll come in and figure out what's actually being done that day because maybe they can't, maybe one of them's still in CAD and it doesn't have a while to go, but we need to get the drivetrain powder coated and assembled. So then they'll help powder coat and assemble the drivetrain. Sweet, that sounds like a great system. Um, our next question's from chat. Do you have any suggestions or strategies for quick and accurate prototyping? Ethan, do you want to talk about prototype? Sure. So one of the systems that we use uh, is Protopipe. Uh, it's a system uh, we, we, we made a document on it. I believe it's protopipe.spectrum3.org. You can access the full document. And it's, uh, it's basically we use a system that uses 3D printed connectors for half inch nominal PVC pipe that allows us to quickly build bench tests and prototypes, especially early on in the season for uh, quick and accurate prototyping. We can put something together to see whether or not geometries work. And that's something that's really helped us these past years. Um, yeah, so with that system, the whole goal is how do we make something that's easily adjustable? Um, we wanted to make it super cheap so that if we have multiple subgroups working on things, we're not, uh, we're not spending a lot of money on material through the prototyping process. Um, so we'll kind of go through it pretty, we'll, we'll go through it pretty quickly. PVC pipe is dirt cheap for 10 foot lengths of it. So we'll just buy a bunch of it and have it ready to go. And we can cut it and pretty much do the whole system with just hand tools and hand drills. Um, and this can give us a lot of our rough layouts. So if we're trying to figure out, okay, well, we'll maybe do a couple sketches, figure out, okay, the ball's this big, we have this wheel, we need it kind of in this range of space. Um, and then we'll build a prototype, or we'll build a prototype setup that allows us to move um, something back and forth. So like in that top video, you can see like we can move the shooters back and forth or the wheels for the Frisbee shooter. So if we didn't know what the gap was between those wheels, we could adjust it with that system. Um, it allows us to mount flat plates to it pretty easily. So if we like there, if we need a two by four for the other side of it, we can do that. Um, we built most of our intake, a lot of our intake prototyping the last two years were done with prototype at the beginning, just kind of seeing how the balls or game pieces um, interact with spinning objects. Um, and then from there, we'll move up to laser cut prototypes out of um, either masonite hardboard, kind of cheap plate stuff, um, or some cheap plywood as well. Um, and, we'll, and our laser cutter is so fast that kids can just basically throw together some sketches really fast, maybe assemble a really quick block assembly, um, and then be able to build something relatively quickly. And we'll try to make sure that whatever they're building is designed to be iterated very fast. So if they need to make new plates, they can, but a lot of times we'll try to build 
plates that have different mounting holes, different mounting options. So we can kind of go through and figure out and learn what we're trying to figure out um, pretty quickly. So that's a big part of prototyping is we have to go in knowing what we're trying to learn, right? It doesn't help just to build an intake. We have to know what are we actually trying to learn from this intake. That's a great system. How do you pick or calculate the right spring for the job, especially for elevators? Uh, that's a good question. A lot of it's just guessing. <laughs> yeah. Let's go on to McMaster and look at the the subsystem lead, basically pick the spring, and Alan orders the spring. Yeah, you get close. So, like, for the elevators, it's like, oh, we know the carriage and the ball assembly is going to be so much weight. It's going to be so close. It's going to be so much weight. We don't know how exactly how much, but we can get a rough idea. We know about how long the travel is going to be. Um, so we'll look on um, either Vulcan Spring or Master, depending on where we're getting stuff from, um, and find something that fits close to what we need. Um, and then most of the time, you fix the rest of it through, for the elevators, you're fixing the rest of it through PID loops. So even if it's not perfectly balanced, you don't really care. You're just worried if it's assisted enough where motor doesn't have to be fully stalling to hold the entire weight of whatever it is. Um, for the torsion springs, I don't think we did anything. They're literally just random torsion springs I bought that I knew would fit over the axles we were using. Um, and it was ever size it worked. And as long as the pneumatic, because you're just helping, you're, all you're doing is assisting the pneumatic cylinder because we're still extending and retracting um, with air. So as long as it's not too much that the pneumatic can't bring it up, you don't really care as long as it's able to deploy it or you can't push it down. Sorry, I had that backwards. Uh, oh, the last thing, we do have a giant bin of springs as well, so we just eventually just collected stuff. So for some of the prototypes, they just go and grab things, and then we try to get close to that thing that was in the giant bin of springs. Sweet. I think we have something pretty similar to that as well. Um, our next one from chat is, how do you come up with the, how do you come to a consensus on designs without voting? Hmm. Um, so uh, one of the ways you do that, like if we have like two competing like like ideas, uh, we'll just ask each other like like why do you think your idea like what benefits do yours have? We lay out like pros and cons, and then we one person tries to convince the other, and after convincing and giving like like logical justifications for why they want their idea, we eventually start to agree upon some certain things that eventually leads to us agreeing on uh, in general a design. Yeah, so I think the, a really good example this year was us figuring out where our intake is, was in relation to our shooter and which direction they were facing. There was a, how long did we spend? An hour and a half, two hours? Yeah. Yeah, it was a long time. The while, where everyone was just in the room. This was probably the first Tuesday, second Tuesday? Probably the second Tuesday of Bill, I think. It was one of our design reviews. We kind of went through what the prototype progress was, and they were like, all right, we have to make a decision on this thing. We're gonna be here a while. And so we like built up a slide deck, kind of explained it to everybody. Um, and then we had several people on different competing sides. I definitely went into that very adamant one way and we came out of it very different from where I thought we were gonna end up. Um, just because we walked through how everything was gonna affect our robot, how it was gonna affect the build, how it was gonna affect us actually in match play. Um, and we ended up with the intake on one side the shooter mounted and facing the opposite way and like on the far side of the robot as well. Um, and I think you can see that in our design review. You can see kind of some of the reasons why we did that um, is in the blog this year. But it was just a lot of discussion on what do all these choices affect and how do we get to the right answer, right? For some of it, it's also performance-based. So like if, you're, if you don't like the thing that we're doing for the intake, build a better intake and prove us wrong. And then we'll like, the, the, we have a lot of stuff in the lab. If you're actually, if you're absolutely adamant that our intake is not good enough, part of your job is to help improve it. Um, so at some point that becomes less optional at some point, if we're just too close to an event or we just don't have enough time, but we try very early on to get everybody to go through as many ideas as we can. If we're, we'll try to get through stuff quickly. And if something's not working, we'll ditch it. It's trying to push down the path that seems like it's going to give us the best result. That's great. What does your CAD fabrication process look like? Um, the majority of our parts are laser cut now. So basically, um, once a part is fully CADed, uh, most of the fabrication actually happens by the same people who CAD the parts. So the person who, whoever is making the part and CADing it, they'll just save it as a DXF upload it to our GravCAD and 
within two or three minutes, they could have it cut on the laser cutter and produced. Uh, yeah, so those are for all plastic or wooden parts. They yeah. get done on the laser. Um, if it's sheet metal, it's a little, it's a harder process. Yeah. We, we this year we tried to pull off as little sheet metal as we can. Um, we probably didn't have as many people who, just because it, it takes longer, right? Like Jack said, well, have, if you design a part for our laser cutter in house, if you're just going to cut it out of um, Delrin or Polycarb, you can be done in ten or fifteen minutes. If you do the same part with our sponsor it's going to be a week plus after we do quite a lot of work to make sure we have the whole, you have to make the whole drawing for it. You have to do everything to get it ready to send to them. And we normally do those in batches. Uh, so as much as we can, we'll build up at least prototype everything in plastic and wood first. Um, and then if we realize, okay, it needs to be an actual sheet metal part, especially a bent part, we'll do it that way. Um, some of the other stuff we will, we do have a router so we can route aluminum too in house. Um, we just don't do it as much, it's just a little bit slower. Um, and then other parts get made through, um, if, you're, if it's something you can't do, if you're one of the subsystem leads and you can't assemble it yourself or you don't have somebody, we can try to get them to have other people manufacture as much as they can, um, but they'll make a drawing for it and we have people who operate the lathe per se and they'll make the shafts, which kind of makes sure you're following up and getting sure all that stuff's actually getting done. Sweet. Now that's a more of an outreach question. Um, this is also from chat. Do you have any outreach requirements? How do you motivate your team members to do outreach? Um, we don't have any actual requirements for our team. Uh, our, both of our schools have requirements for both NHS and just general outreach requirements. So a lot of students will do outreach to get hours for those, but also it's pretty fun to just do outreach. All of our outreach efforts are fun and don't require a ton of yeah, a lot uh, of it energy. Is, yeah, I was say a lot of it yeah. is that we make sure that the students on the team know that why the outreach is important and why we should be doing it, and like it meets the broader mission of what we're trying to do as a team. Um, and then we do we try to make them fun. So a lot of them are volunteering at robot events. So we'll go to a bunch of X events or uh, FLL events and things and volunteer there. Um, or we'll, and then afterwards and things, we'll, I'll treat them to ice cream or something just to thank them for coming out. But it's normally, it's not, it's pretty easy to get enough people out to the events we need them to um, for most of the things we're doing. Or like the demos and stuff, people like going, they get to learn to drive the robot and talk to people and things. So you get to share what you did and things. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and generally we do kind of smaller outreach events. There's not that many where we need like the full team Generally, it's 10 people or less at most of them. Yeah, well, we'll do certain classes and things where we're teaching kids, and we'll have five or six people there to be able to teach them to build little Lego or Vex IQ robots or whatever we're doing that day. Sounds like a very effective system. Our next question is also from chat. How many people are on your team? Do you have any strategies for making sure that members stay engaged during meetings? Okay, so yeah, so this is a tricky question. So our team definitely fluctuates. So one of our goals as a team is to get, is to not necessarily, we know that not everybody has the time to be super dedicated to an FRC team, but we don't want those people to not want to be able to be inspired to do engineering or to see what we're doing. Um, so we, at the moment, as much as we can, we try not to um, turn anyone away. So anyone who wants to be on the team can. Um, that does lead to some interesting things where you get a lot of people signed up. So our early rosters in the fall may have, 80 to 100 people on them, but we know that that won't be what's actually on the FRT team. Those people aren't going to be, not nearly that many people are going to be dedicated to it um, come the spring. Um, but we, during the fall, we may have different little events that we're doing to introduce some of the new people or some people who are only there um, in the fall because they have other sports or things that they do in the spring. Um, so we'll do different uh, speaker series or we'll have different um, programming lessons or things that we have some things that aren't even related to FRC that we do just to get people interested in in STEM fields or get them exposed to a few things that they may not know existed and kind of decide whether they want to do this for real for us, or maybe they decide I don't want to do FRC, but I do want to be an engineer. That's cool too. Um, and then during the actual spring, um, we'll have normally about 20 ish people at meetings, um, maybe a little bit more. Cause a lot of people, like I said, will have other activities they're doing, or they just may have homework that day. We don't require anyone to be at any specific meeting. We'll have a core group that's at it basically every meeting. A lot of those are the subsystem leads. Um, and then most of the time it's going around in there either um, 
people who aren't necessarily assigned to a subsystem are asking what else to do. Um, we started the EveryBot project this year. So we had a group of new students who were building an EveryBot um, kind of alongside us um, just so they could get trained on a different robot because we saw that we had less kind of assembly and specific things to do in the last year or two. Um, yeah, so we're definitely not perfect at that, but we try to do what we can to get people engaged and realizing that they can be helping us in some way. So our next question is from chat as well. How do you get your team excited about documentation? How do you make sure documentation stays consistent throughout the season? Um, well, all the subsystem leads do a lot of the actual documentation and most of it's just taking photos and uploading them to SmugMug where we store all of our photos and videos. Um, a lot of people get excited about it because if you upload consistently, then you could potentially consistently have videos and things on the blog. I know uh, a lot of times we had uh, vision stuff this year because one of our students was very excited about getting onto the blog. So he would try to get onto the blog as much as he could. Yeah, I think a lot of it is there. We get, we get uh, like I said, we talk a lot about the mission of the team and kind of what we do. So that most of the people on the team understand why the sharing is important. And they also get, um, they see some of the feedback too. So whenever somebody sends me a note saying thanks or whatever, I share it with the team. Um, so they get really excited about it. So I know a really good example is 2018, our intake, um, the student lead was actually Ethan's brother um, on that intake system was extremely excited that other people were using it and would like send me every shot he ever saw of like robots that were using it or he was like ah there's somebody else is using it so he was super excited to share and document uh, just because he was really excited other teams were benefiting from his work and he was just excited they thought it was cool and useful so a question more about this year what is something you wish you'd done differently on this year's robot um big thing uh, kind of wish we hadn't been trying to build up bike climb the entire season because we kind of we didn't sacrifice that much but we made a few sacrifices when we did that and our actual climber ended up being a lot bulkier than it needed to be because we were designing it to hold two robots when it's only it was only ever going to hold one after we decided not to have a buddy climb um, yeah, and then the, the thing that was broken the most at Dripping Springs was the, uh, we had Vex Pro Omniwells on one side of our drivetrain, mm. and we broke many of them. Um, and we broke many front wheels in general at Dripping Springs, so we were already looking at how to um, add shielding for those um, and figure out how to redo some of the drivetrain with the bumps. They were just way more vicious, even though we tested them. Like, we had the actual steel barriers on carpet early on in the season. We ran robots over them. We never broke anything. As soon as competition started, three or four matches in, we were snapping rollers all over the place. Um, so that was, it was just way more, um, it was way more violent on those front wheels than we ever thought. Like, I guess we just didn't do enough testing to really make sure that that was going to be um, sustainable. So next, I'll we'll move into our wrap our section. Um, so these will be pretty quick and short questions. Uh, so the first one is, do your students stick to a single sub team each year or move they around? Can, we can move around and kind of do whatever we're interested in. I mean, after doing mechanical for two years, if you want to, you can just start doing programming only. so that another robot can drive on top of it. So you can go look at some of the, some examples in, um, especially 18, some are examples in 19, um, where teams had to drive on top of another team. What is your work schedule during season? Mm. That's a good question. Um, so briefly, basically we meet every day. So starting two days before kickoff, we'll start having meetings and then we won't, there'll be very few days where we don't have somebody in the lab doing something basically all the way out to championship. So like there's a couple days where I'm at an event or something and the kids may take a break, but even then they're normally doing something um, for at least a few hours after school. Um, but like I said, we don't have any required specific meetings. So there's a lot of different people coming in and out um, at different times, working on things and getting things ready to go. What materials do you use to 3D print your pulleys? Uh, this year they were all PLA plus. Um, but we have used polycarbon in the past. We've used PETG in the past. We've used nylon, but PLO plus has worked and we didn't have any issues with them this year. 
How many does how many designers do you have? Uh, the majority of the design of our robot is done by probably five or six students, but there's a lot of people who contribute like smaller parts of it and help out do it. There were at so. least uh, there were at least a twelve people who did CAD on this year's robot. Yeah. Yeah. I think. What does the technician or technical distribution look like? Like how many students are are technical students versus non technical students? That's yeah. the question I was asking. Um, I would say the majority of students are technical, but there's definitely students who don't do technical stuff and focus on outreach and other things. Yeah, even the media. But, but, yeah, but, for, for the most part, most of the students who do do non technical work also are doing technical work. Like people move around, they do uh, like many people are, people are interested in a lot of things. People do what's needed and. Uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people are doing both. We've had people on the team on occasion who have just been like, I don't really want to touch the robot. I just want to do writing and awards. And I'm like, cool. But even then, they eventually do some of the robot a little bit, right? Like, we'll have them rivet. We'll have them do something and help with assembly, help organize, get stuff ready. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to First and Focus, and thank you, Alan and Spectrum, for your great presentation. We are so happy to see you all here, and we hope to see you again. 